can't say I I've, I've, haven't always wanted to do that. Um, we'll get this meeting going. Anyone who wants to join, please come in. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for attending today's discussion on our roof. Um, my name is Joe Kramer. I'm uh, president of our board. And we have an exciting year ahead of us. And it's going to be a great year so long as many people get involved and get engaged in the big decisions that we have coming up. So thank you for being here. Uh, this is an important step that everyone is here. We're also going to try to pull the veil a bit from our governance model a bit and the process that we have and open it up to more people uh, because it's really vital to have the discussions that we are having. And so we're feeling that the more open we are and the more people involved, the better outcomes. So the board requested the Roof Task Force to present to the congregation today their findings, and we really want to hear what you think. And the process is today we're having really public input, and we're going to be discussing this. Then on the 16th of August, on Wednesday, the board is going to be meeting to go over the findings, to really think about what everyone here has talked about, and come up with a recommendation for what we feel that we should do with the Roof. Then following that, on September 17th, we're going to have another parish meeting, and at that meeting, we will decide as a congregation, we will vote on what do we want to do, given the options that we have at hand. So, and this is going to impact how we use our capital campaign funds. It's also going to signify how much value we place on our facility. It is a beautiful place, and it comes with a cost attached to that beauty. So I very much look forward to the lively discussion today. And that's it. So let's get this going. Thanks, Monica. Hello, everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. We're so glad you're all here. Um, I did want to name that we are videotaping. I think there's many people that are not able to attend today, um, but I think we'll really enjoy the, um, the taping that we're providing online. I also wanted to thank, before we moved ahead, everyone that was involved um, with the roof, roof Advisory team. If you could just wave your hand, these are the people that will be presenting to you today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just eternally grateful for everything that you've done these last seven months. I absolutely could not have done, um, done it alone. So. Um, Without further ado, oh, double guilty. It is. All right, all right, all right. We're in business. All right. So, um, I know that many of you that are coming today are excited uh, about what you might hear. You might also have a fair degree of anticipation or anxiety, um, but everybody take a deep breath. Uh, we're doing the good work. So what needs to be done to the roof in the building is one of the three things that I think you might come wondering today. Another might be, how much is this going to cost us? And thirdly, how will we navigate this project in a way that's inclusive and in line with our values? So before um, I hand things off to Dave Weber, who's going to tell you a little bit about the structural issues, um, I want to just name how this project came to be. So back in June of 2016, uh, Michael and I sat down. We started to think ahead towards the capital campaign that we're about to embark upon. Um, and he created a, a capital campaign case statement. Um, and one of the things that was named there was the need to replace uh, the Loja roof. As I think all of you probably know, we currently have a black rubber membrane uh, that resides there. Um, so that rubber membrane was installed back in 2012, um, and it was expected to last approximately 20 years. Um, at that time, as we were looking forward and thinking about replacing the Loja roof, we anticipated about $650,000. So it was about that time that I recognized I needed help to understand um, all that, that would encompass this, this roof restoration project. 
uh, and Michael uh, recommended a number of, of members that could assist in that regard. Um, so in the winter of 2016, we brought together 10 individuals who, who were to become the roof advisory team um, in order to identify a plan for the Loja roofs replacement. Um, and we wanted to try to propose to the parish what material we thought uh, we could replace that, uh, that roof with. Around that same time, uh, the plaster around the landmark auditorium, as some of you may have noticed, began to sag and small buckets of water started to leak in. Uh, so the project began to expand uh, beyond just the Loja roof. Um, and we, we sought to answer that additional quintessential landmark question, why is the roof leaking again? So in late spring of 2017, after contracting with a structural engineering company, SRI, you'll hear more about them in a bit, um, and see searching deep within the FUS archives, uh, we began to formulate answers to the following questions. Uh, why, is the roof why is the roof leaking in the landmark and how can we fix it? What roof do we recommend placing on the loggia and the landmark? And what expenses can we currently estimate will be associated with both of these tasks? So meanwhile, the roof advisory team was talking a lot and thinking a lot about um, inc inc inclusivity, democracy, and values. Um, and we began to gain clarity around how we could and would navigate this project in a way that was in line with our values. Um, so we, uh, we did draft a charter, uh, which the board approved, and that guided all of our actions. Much of what you'll hear today is um, a direct result of that charter. Here are the things that we wanted to tell the board about and wanted to tell you about. Uh, so ever so briefly, I'll share that we knew we would identify what portions of the roof we would recommend replacing, the factors that have contributed to the building and the roof's need for repair, uh, the consultants and the contractors that have and will be hired, various roof materials that have been considered, and the specific criteria and process used to analyze all of those options. Um, ultimately, we thought we could propose a democratically selected um, material, and we knew we'd tell you how, uh, how much we thought it would cost, as well as a timeline detailing when the various aspects of the proposed work would be initiated and completed. And then finally, uh, we wanted to tell the board how we thought uh, they should talk to all of you about the issues uh, at hand. Um, so without further ado, actually one final thought. Um, one thing that we talked last week with the board about and something that we as, as an advisory team have been thinking a great deal about is, um, is the fact that how we navigate this decision, how we um, maneuver through this process is as important as the decision that we ultimately make. Um, as I mentioned before, we wanted to, to, we wanted to ensure we want to ensure that the decision is democratically selected and that is in line with our UU values. So um, today we're here to present to you the information that we know so far and then also provide ample space to hear your perspectives. Um, some of those things might be questions and sometimes we're just going to listen to what you think we should do. Um, I know the board is taking minutes. Um, if you have follow-up uh, follow thoughts, feel free to email March. Her email address will be provided at the end. Um, so thank you. Thank you again for being here. And now, without further ado, Dave Weber. Hi. Um, I'm Dave Weber, and I've been involved with the building stuff for a long, long time. And what I want to say, the short answer to what we need to replace is everything that leaks. And basic, basically, where's my little green spot? Over here. Okay. I'm looking, no, I'm looking for the laser pointer thing. Oh, that's not doing it. Anyway, what needs to be replaced is all the roof you see in this picture. Well, I'll, I'll describe it anyway. So everything you see in this picture, the entire south-facing slope 
And what, additionally, what you can't see is the north side of Loja, all the way across. Um, in approximately the center of this picture, I would call your attention to the area of the roof under the REP of replace. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that, you know, the rules of perspective say all those horizontal lines in the roof should be getting closer together as you reach the peak. But there's a spot where they get really close together. And that's where the roof is not, not level anymore. That's where it's sagging. Um, what, what's underneath there is, uh, first, there's a copper skin. And I use the term skin advise, intentionally because what you see of the roof is just the skin. The water, what keeps the roof waterproof is deeper inside. So we got a copper skin and we have a layer of tar paper. And then, between those two, there's wooden battens, and that's what gives the roof its shape. These, thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, I hope I can work this one. Yeah. Okay, so these wooden battens are nailed through the tar paper into the wood underneath. Um, and Richard Miller, who follows me, will give you further explanation of that, but remember, nails through the battens, through the tar paper. So what we need to do is take off everything down to the wood deck and replace it with something waterproof. Oops. This is a close-up view of what the roof looks like. And these are some seams that are spreading. This is the area that sags. This is a close-up of the loggia roof. These are pictures I took 10 years ago. And uh, where it bends out to go over the batten, there's been enough flexion that the copper is cracked. This is an example of all the seams that were soldered have broken. And this is where a broken solder seam was caulked and the caulk has failed. This is a view that SRI took. And the important thing to notice here is they strang, strung an orange tape across here, and you can see how much the roof has dropped below what would be a horizontal. And you can see this joint here where it's popping up. And I'll turn it over to Richard Miller, who will discuss the structure, structural issues in greater depth. Roof is a lot tougher issue than uh, PowerPoint slides, but um, we, we learned a lot. We called in uh, SRI uh, contractors to um, tell us about the Loja roof, and, uh, and then they started poking around and they said, "Well, what the roof is, and it you know needs to be replaced, but the real issue is in the auditorium structure." So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, just to give you an orientation, an orientation to um, to that structure. Um, this is a kind of a bird's eye view of the Landmark Auditorium. It has um, 12 trusses, I believe. Uh, up at the prow, they're relatively short trusses, and they're labeled uh, starting at the, at the top of the prow with truss A. So truss A is down here somewhere, and they go back and forth across. Uh, there's truss F, truss G, truss H uh, is a pretty long span. Um, <laughs> Truss I is a really long span, and it's what you're walking underneath when you go from the lobby to the loggia. You're walking underneath Truss I. Um, and uh, Truss I is an issue, will be and has been an issue since the landmark was constructed. We'll be talking about that. There's a little red line here. Uh, you'll see that's actually a cable that's strung along the bottom of Truss I to, uh, to stiffen it and reinforce it. And that was done. Sorry, the cable's on J, yes. Oh, you're right, Tom, thank you. Um, I is a bit of an issue. J is, J is what I'm really going to be talking about. That's the one you're walking under. J is both holding up the roof, as they all are, 
but Jay is also uh, holding up the false balcony who's suspended from trust J largely. Uh, and then there's a trust K and an L. Um, K and L, uh, K in particular, were reinforced in the mid 90s with I beams, uh, and uh, and there's, that's that's pretty darn strong right now. So, okay, so that's the structure. What are the issues? Um, without the structural repair, we're told that the landmark auditorium roof is at the end of its useful life. Um, so that sounds pretty dire, and it is. Um, but we can do something about it. The design and construction flaws uh, that, that have existed through its history have not yet been fully addressed, but we believe they can be. Uh, Trust J, the long span supporting the balcony, was to have in the original design two stone piers in the middle of the auditorium, kind of in that boundary between the hearth room and the, and the uh, worship space. Um, those were removed from the plans during construction uh, mid midstream by the architect. Yeah, he was the yes. Frankly, Wright is the architect. And he, he, you know, you can un you can understand the visual appeal of removing stone piers from the middle of the room. Um, it made it a big open space. However, those piers uh, had a function. Um, the architect also rejected the builder's recommendation to use two by sixes instead of two by fours. We think there are some two by sixes in there, but the truss structure is largely uh, two by fours. Um, there is, aside from all of that, the, the fact that we have wood, wooden trusses that are only um, uh, nailed together. Uh, they have an inherent problem uh, with a limited lifespan because the nails with flexing gradually slip uh, and the trusses sag. It's technically load slippage or nail slippage. Um, so there's a limited lifespan to trusses that are just nailed together. Um, so we know at least uh, two trusses will require reinforcement, uh, J and I. In the details, Trust J in 1961, without those supporting piers, and only 10 years after the meeting house was dedicated, Trust J was sagging five inches, and the congregation was upset and made complaints to Taliesin. Taliesin sent Wes Peters uh, to direct, uh, direct the installation of a fix, which uh, was an off-center one-inch cable that stiffened and reinforced that truss. Uh, the current status is that cable is there, it's doing its job, uh, but it also has bowed the truss uh, by being very stiff and twisted the truss, which is causing the deflection on the roof surface that Dave pointed out. So it's not the copper on the roof, it's the it's the twist and flex and, and issues with the structure underneath uh, that's been giving us issues for a long time. The stress uh, from trust um, J is being passed up at certainly to trust I and perhaps further. And as it flexes, that cable is cutting a channel into the adjacent wood. The flexing truss has caused uh, the soldered copper joints to break, allowing water to penetrate again, as you saw in Dave's pictures. Trust K, um, I mentioned in 1979 and 94, again, was, was worked on and was reinforced with the I-beam, and the current status is that it continues to indeed properly support the lower roof uh, over the, very close to the edge of the hearth room. Um, this is a picture of that cable. It's, um, it's a fairly substantial one-inch cable, and you can see here as it's slowly digging a channel into the, into the wood that it's uh, adjacent to. Um, I wasn't sure what a truss was, to tell you the truth, till I saw diagrams like this, so I'm gonna share this. Uh, this is uh, Truss J. Um, the unique design of the trusses at the meeting house are kind of two triangular pieces, kind of a bow tie shape. Uh, they meet in the middle here, which is kind of a little bit of a flex point. Um, and, uh, and here's where the cable runs across the bottom on, on one side of truss J. It's actually on this side of the truss. Uh, the yellow boards, they're not actually yellow in the roof, it's just in the illustration. Those were put in as, as part of the, uh, along with the cable in 1961 to shore up the truss. We're not actually sure what these two boards are doing, but these two are pretty important too. Um, the loges that way, the lobby, note the lobby end of the truss actually isn't sitting on a stone pier. 
It's on another truss that runs across the entrance from the lobby. Um, so that's the kind of structural thing. So the roof system, so that's the structure issues, uh, which are complex. The roof itself also has design and construction issues, and basically it's old. Um, the structural issues, as I said, have caused most of the roof issues over the years. The modified Bermuda design, as David showed you, is shaped by horizontal battens. The architect's design, uh, it's a modified Bermuda because the architect added flat steps to the classic Bermuda roof. The structural flexing has caused some of those battens to actually slope backwards, allowing water to pool and then to penetrate through the copper seams. Um, the battens were nailed, as, as Dave indicated, were nailed through the waterproof underlayment and that allows water to penetrate the nail holes. So water gets in the copper through the seams that are opened up by flexing. The water finds its way down through the nail holes and, um, and then down uh, into, the, into the ceiling. These, this error was repeated in the 1994 uh, rebuild of the roof at the insistence of uh, preservation architects that we were required to use. So not by our preservationists, by preservation architects. Um, again, the, uh, the classic Bermuda roof would run from the bottom of one step to the top of the next, so it's these little, uh, hor these little uh, horizontal uh, steps that, were, that are part of the architectural unique feature of this. Uh, and these, some of them now slant backwards, so this is where water would pool in that area. Um, a little bit of copper issues. The original copper wasn't what, uh, what was specified. It's a 14 ounce soft copper instead of the more standard 16 or 20 ounce cold rolled copper. That's probably due to what the material was available at the time, 1950. Um, numerous seams have been soldered or, and or caulked with a variety of materials over the years, mixed results. The 1994 copper over the auditorium has deflected, as we've been saying, at leaks due to the structural issues of truss J. Elsewhere, uh, over the loggia and the B-wing, the 1951 copper is, uh, is just worn and pitted. Um, a rubber membrane, as you know, seals the loggia and B-wing roofs. And uh, I would note that the two steep sections that are over the prow, the really steep ones that have, have that original uh, green patina, uh, are original, but they're still functional because they're so darn steep. They're, they still are, are do a good job, and we're hoping that um, in any project they can be retained. Um, now, Sam Lawrence will take you into the overview of the structural repairs approach itself. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about what we had to look at as far as um, what the repairs needed to be and how we can make those repairs to the structure, first of all. And that's the key point, is that's the number one thing. We thought going in that we had to replace the roof, and what it turns out is the most important thing is we have to fix the structure. We've had some just very preliminary conversations with SRI, but as you'll hear later, we're also talking to some other consultants to really hone in on what the right solution is for that. But the, the, the leading contender right now on how we would do that is we would add what is called light gauge steel. So you might be familiar with commercial construction. You see the drywall walls being manufactured or put in place. And it's a steel, it looks like a two by four, but it's made out of, of thin steel. You can use those structurally. Um, in fact, a lot, of, a lot of buildings have trusses that are built out of this. And that's what we would do. So we can, we'll have to figure out how we get them in there, but certainly the, the best approach would be to bring them in from the top when the roof is removed. We could cut some um, holes in the, on the wood sheathing that's up there and feed materials down in from above rather than ripping out the plaster below and bringing in um, things from, from underneath. Hopefully we can bring them in from above. But a lot of this has to be investigated further with, with engineers and contractors how we're going to actually approach this. And, of course, while that's happening, we have to keep the water out of the building. So there are a lot of things that need to be resolved. Um, so it's likely to be uh, a, um, certainly an engineered solution, but a combination of maybe of some um, either off-site or on-the-ground construction, but then also 
um, with a group of people working up inside of the attic. Um, as I said, it can be installed during the re-roofing process. So, um, you know, we, we wouldn't have to do one. In fact, in many cases, it's probably not really feasible to do one and not the other. Um, that would certainly minimize the disruption to below, which is important. Um, and then the way the, the ultimate design would work is that these new steel, and in, in particular we're talking about um, that one on, on truss J, uh, but it could be um, truss I, and as you change the load, we fix one, what happens to the next one is another question that we have to investigate. How far up do we need to go? Um, that's an issue that has to be addressed. But as we create the solution, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to transfer the roof load to these new trusses, and the existing trusses now would only carry the, the weight of the ceiling. So much, much less load and, and would be able to, to carry that load. Um, but we wouldn't remove any of the existing trusses. And then another question, and it, and it kind of has to do with that same idea, is as, as we change the, the structural stability of certain trusses, what happens on up above? Um, that load creep that, that Richard talked about with when you nail trusses together, well, obviously we have several more um, trusses that are nailed together. And while we're, up, while we're up there and while we're at it, we want to look at what the proper um, approach is to repairing that as well. And I, our initial assessment is that's not as big a deal, but it's certainly something that we need to investigate. So the next thing I want to talk about is, okay, so what have we looked at as far as the roof replacement is, is concerned? And, um, and we, we've looked at several. The first one, obviously, is just what do we, you know, let's replace it with what's there. So the copper Bermuda roof. One thing I want to, we've, we've said it before, and I'll stress it again, and Susan will repeat it, is that it's the issue where they put nails through the battens, through the tar paper, has created a path for water to get in. And the purpose of the copper is simply, it, it, it's to shed the water, and most of it should get out that way, but the real waterproofing is that layer of tar paper. So putting nails through it's not a good idea. Um, there is technology that is, you may have heard of ice and water shield when you're replacing your own roof that you put down at the eave line. That material would be a great solution. You can, you can actually put a nail through it, but it's self-healing. It, it would be a vast improvement. And so, that's kind of a given on any solution, is that we would put that membrane down, uh, and then it's a matter of what you put over the top. So the first thing we looked at was um, the copper Bermuda roof. Um, we wanted to investigate other materials. What would the cost implications be if we tried something else? Um, so keeping that same detail, but doing it out of a uh, painted steel uh, was another option that we looked at. Um, the, you know, kind of the most common roofing materials that we most likely have on most of our houses is asphalt shingles. Um, it's the least expensive uh, material out there, and we wanted to see what the cost implications, and um, I'll talk next about what things we use to, to kind of rate um, the various options. Um, we wanted that, and, and want, there's a couple different ways you can do that. You could put it, put it with the battens in it, and so you still get that step Bermuda, Bermuda look. And then the other one would be just to skip the battens altogether, put a flat plane of, of copper shingles up there. And we'll talk about the costs of those options in a minute. Um, there we go. So the next uh, thing, so we as a committee were charged with providing a recommendation. We've done all this investigative work. Um, when we go back to the board, we were asked to provide a recommendation. And you'll hear about our recommendation before we're done here uh, this afternoon. Um, so we had, to, we had to look at, you can't, our, our goal was to not just, I feel like we should do this. We wanted to come up with some criteria that helped us analyze what are um, the things that are important in making this decision. And in no particular order, um, here they are. So durability, we want it to last a long time. Let's make sure that we, we think about that. Cost and affordability, 
can you know what what is the savings as we go from one material to the next or the added costs as we move from one material to the next what implications does that repair have on the structural issues that we already have and you'll hear more about it but asphalt is more heavy is heavier than copper and so do we add structural implications as we change materials we needed to look at that the waterproofness is grayed out and that's because as we started to investigate more we realized the the ability to keep the water out of the building has to do with that membrane that's underneath and it's really not as much about what's on top and so it's really the same for everything um, preservation of the Frank Lloyd Wright vision that is a national historic landmark it's considered one of the most uh, important pieces of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright architecture and so that has to be part of our consideration as we as we look at options we talk quite a bit about the in, uh, environmental impact that this work will have um, on on the world um, and there's a couple things that come into play one is the ability to put um, uh, solar panels on the roof and what 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 does that mean to any of the roof replacement options and the second piece is um, copper asphalt steel all have implications on the environment copper is a very um, is very un environmentally unfriendly when you mine it now one thing we have found out is that the copper that's used in roofing material is 90 to 95 percent recycled so that doesn't eliminate the concern but it, it reduces it. steel is uh, a, another one that's highly recycled and asphalt um, is uh, is a, a petroleum product so that they, they all have some environmental impact that we we wanted to make sure we consider in addition to the ability to put um, uh, solar panels on the roof what are, how does it align with our UU principles? I, you know, and, and you need, that's something I think you need to think about individually. What does it mean to you, our, our responsibility to the original church and, and its relationship with the, the greater web, with everybody else? There are people that come and tour that facility from all over the world. Uh, what does it mean environmentally? What does the cost difference mean to our ability to do other things with money that we could be raising in this capital campaign and that's an inv individual thing that it's important to think about um, is it aesthetically pleasing separate from the frank lloyd wright vision but it's a beautiful building and we want to keep in in mind what does that mean as we make a decision and then there's another piece what what implications does each one of these solutions have on the ability to inspire capital campaign contributions both internally and externally internally there are people that would probably say i would rather give more money to a solution that is less expensive because of what i just talked about we could use that money to do some more social justice things but there's also external there is um you know a, a pretty high likelihood because of the National Historic Landmark status, because of our, um, because of the Frank Lloyd Wright perspective of this, that would, hopefully we would be able to garner some, some capital campaign money from outside of the congregation. Um, so those are, those are the things that we, you know, kind of the criteria that we put together. Now Susan's going to come up and talk about how we, as the, as the group, felt each one of these um, weighed in on that. So the first, the first option that we talked about was the copper Bermuda roof. Um, and you can see the, the advantages and concerns that we came up with. Uh, what, what are listed on these slides, we didn't, we didn't list here. Um, advantages or concerns about every single criteria, just the ones that actually um, sparked something. For instance, the waterproofing, as, as Sam noted, that was consistent among all of the options, so we didn't list it on the slide. So if we didn't have a, a significant advantage or concern for an option, it's not listed on the slide. So uh, for the copper Bermuda roof, um, You know what, Monica, I'm just going to let you go with that. 
So the um, significant advantage of the copper is that it's the most durable of all the materials. It, um, it could, can last up to 100 years, um, and the, the thing to think about with that is replacement cost. So we know that we have a significant cost to incur with, with the structural repairs, which we hope that we will have to do once, and then um, if we have the copper, we, we would hope we would only have to replace that once in any of our lifetimes. Uh, the concern, of course, that goes with that is that copper is the highest cost option. It's worth um, keeping in mind that the cost for all of the materials, uh, the difference among the cost for all the materials is smaller than you might anticipate, and Mike will talk about that in a minute, because the, the labor is the most significant portion of the cost, and that stays constant for all of them because of, particularly because of the slope of the roof, makes labor, uh, makes labor a high cost for all of them. Um, the copper, of course, hues most closely to Frank Lloyd Wright's vision. That was the original material. Um, however, with the um, quality of the air in our contemporary world, the copper will not patent it, um, in the way that it did originally. So the copper will, um, it will eventually be brown as it is now in the replaced part of the prow, uh, but it will never get green in the way that it is on the, on the wings of the prow. Um, it would also be obscured by any um, solar array if we were to choose to put solar anywhere on the, on the roof. So that is the, the biggest reason, um, in addition to just wanting to have an array of options, that we looked at um, asphalt shingles, was to understand what it would look like to have an, um, an option that we would be basically willing to put solar panels on top of. So, um, so the copper would pretty much out um, rule out putting any solar on top of the, the roof. Um, we believe that copper might be, would be most likely to attract outside capital campaign contributions because any group that was interested in historic preservation, Frank Lloyd Wright, would be most likely to be giving us money to put copper on, back on the building and would be very unlikely to, to fund doing anything else. Um, we, have the, the may inspire capital campaign contributions internally. Again, in the way that, that as Sam uh, pointed out, some members of our congregation may be um, very, very much inspired by replacing the copper roof. Uh, we believe that there also might be members who are inspired by um, keeping the money to do other things, to do for social justice, uh, saving money just uh, to pay down the mortgage, that there can be many other things that, that some of our members might be inspired by. So we also believe that putting the copper roof on might discourage capital campaign contributions. Uh, we got all of them, yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, the second option, the painted steel Bermuda roof. This would be um, steel or another metal that would be painted to resemble patinated copper. So it would be the second most durable of the options coming in 50 or 60 years. So again, the issue there is replacement cost. When would we need to replace that, that metal? Uh, would be more affordable than copper. It's the middle of the three options in terms of affordability at the outset. Uh, it would be significantly more expensive than copper. <laughs> I think I'd know it by heart, but I don't.
basic, um, the basic other disadvantage or concern about the painted steel is uh, what it would actually look like. Um, the, the, the copper has an organic look as it patinates. Painted steel is never going to do that. It's going to have, it's going to have just the, the look, the flat look of being painted. So we would absolutely want to see a sample of it, a significant sample of it, before we decided to go that way. The hope, of course, is that it would look very similar to patinated copper, but you can't know that until you see it. Um, so, so that's really the additional concern there. Um, then, then we get to the two asphalt options, and the two asphalt options, as Sam mentioned, one is asphalt shingles that have the detailing, um, like the Bermuda roof, and one is the asphalt shingles that are flat. And again, the, the significant, um, the real reason to be to be seriously considered uh, to seriously consider the asphalt is that they would allow us to put solar panels, particularly on the Loja roof. Uh, another advantage of the asphalt is that there would be more affordable than the than either of the metal options. They are of course furthest from the Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright vision. They are at least durable of the materials. They come in 30 to 40 years when, when we would be likely to have to replace them, so that's about half of the lifetime of copper. Um, they are three times as heavy as copper, and so there's a potential um, that we would have to do additional structural reinforcement on top of the, the things that we know we have to do just in order to stabilize the roof. Um, can somebody make that? Do people want to look at this? So yeah, you're about right. Whoever is doing it, that's about where I am. Yeah. Um, so yeah, cost of additional structural additional structural reinforcement, and then of course um, it doesn't replicate the Frank Lloyd Wright design. Concern about its visual appeal, um, and we are told by our um, preservation architect that we would lose our landmark status if we went to either of the asphalt um, options. I'm now incapable of making that slide go further. <laughs> so the next slide is to do the, the asphalt shingles with the flat option, no Bermuda detailing, and that has basically, um, it, has, it has basically all of the same um, advantages and concerns as, um, as with the Bermuda detailing. Uh, it's cheapest, yes, it's a little cheaper. The one um, additional thought is that is whether these would um, potentially inspire capital campaign contributions because of the, the solar option. And uh, Mike May will talk to you about the details of cost. I'm going to talk to you about the roof repair costs. And I'd start out by saying these are uh, estimates that we're dealing with at this point, but we think they're pretty good estimates based on the, the consultants that we've used and what we started with. And I'm going to start first of all with the structural repair costs, and this is very important. It has to be done before we can do anything about putting on copper or not putting on copper, and it's required for all options. No matter what kind of roof we're going to put on top, we have to fix the structural problems in the auditorium. So the cost of reinforcing, I'm assuming both trusses, I and J with those lightweight steel trusses, somewhere between $150,000 to $300,000. We're thinking that we can reinforce A to H with just metal gussets, which is a minimal amount of cost, that that'll be sufficient with them. We don't know until we get in there and look at them. Um, any option uh, using shingles at three times the weight is going to require both additional study, and we think it's likely additional uh, structural repair. The numbers in here with the question marks, because I just made those up. I have no, we have no idea what that would cost in either event, but we know it's out there and something we'd have to deal with. Um, and then there's additional costs for uh, construction, on-site management. You have to protect the building. We have to look at the possibility of some ventilation 
which when added to the 150 to 300,000, we come up with a range in here of somewhere between 500 and $700,000 for the structural repairs. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, then we have money that we put in for additional consultants and contractors, roof mock-ups. Uh, we mentioned some additional studies that might be needed. We put in sixty to seventy thousand dollars for that, and that's going to be again required to some extent for all the options uh, that we're going to look at. Um, and then I'm going to go through each of these four that have been explained to you and give you the, the costs on those that were evaluated by SRI. As has been pointed out, all the options assume this double layer of uh, waterproof. Uh, under underlayment so that that's the same uh, in all of them. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, first option is the copper roof replacement, uh, assuming some 16-ounce copper, assuming a Bermuda style as, as Wright designed it. As has been pointed out, it's not going to get a patent like the green. The estimated cost for doing the auditorium, the loggia, and the B-wing is about $990,000. Plus, there's a contingency on all these. I'm going to add in the contingency at the end, but that's the estimated cost. You always add in a contingency for things that may come up. As with all of these options, most of the cost is in the labor of putting it on, not, not necessarily in the materials. And uh, there's no salvage value in the copper that's up there to FUS. Part of you will see that some of them, we're getting some money from our insurance company for the damage caused by hail. When that happens, they want the copy that, that they are essentially reimbursing us for. We're assuming we might be able to keep some to sell some more earrings or what other uh, things that people might want. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, second option is this painted steel replacement. Uh, it's a popular roofing material. Uh, it could be colored. We don't hopefully get something like the copper patina that we had before. Very important that we get some examples, some mock-ups of this to see what it looks like to decide whether or not that is something that, that, that we like. Uh, and the estimated cost here for the auditorium, Loge and B-Wing, $820,000. So you see the delta there, we're about 170, and then plus the contingency that we'll add in later. If you go to standard fiberglass shingles with the Bermuda style, it's about 790,000. So you can see that in most of these, the, the, the delta is not that much different between them because of the labor involved. As we mentioned, uh, three times, uh, the weight of the other options, uh, and both of the shingles would allow some uh, solar work. Um, estimated cost, if you have the Bermuda design for those areas, about $790,000. Um, okay, next slide, here we are. Option four, the plain fiberglass shingles, no Bermuda design. The cost there is estimated at about $416,000. Again, the same issues that we talked about, and, and our preservation architect says, if if you go to the shingles, you're going to lose your national landmark status. It just, you just can't keep it unless you keep some kind of a metal roof that looks like what Mr. Wright uh, put on here back in the beginning. And if you add this contingency of 20% to those options, depending on which one, of course, it adds about another $195,000 uh, to $353,000. If you see the SRI report, they added some of the contingency into their original numbers, so, they, so we pulled it out so you'll don't be confused by the fact that their numbers are a little bit different. They've added the contingency into it. So then we get to the grand total. And this is a wide range because each one of these four options has a low and a high range because of some of the differences. So what, we, what I put on this slide is just the lowest range of the cheapest one, plain asphalt, that comes to a total of about 1.2 million. And the most expensive range of the most expensive one, the copper, comes to about 2.2 million. Uh, we then have income coming in from insurance, which is right now we're estimating about 380. It might be more than that that could be used. And then we, were, we had originally uh, committed about 1.3 million of a 3 million capital campaign, which brings us to about 1.7 million, about halfway between those ranges there. Um, so that's, that's what we have in terms of costs and, uh, and possible income. And at this point, Tom, you are gonna be up next. Uh, we have engaged the services of uh, SRI again. They were involved in the, the 1994 uh, re-roofing of the auditorium, but this time their mandate has been increased uh, to include the substrate as well as the, the finished surface. And uh, as you've heard, uh, Rene Dupuy, their principal, 
uh, working in the newly uh, reorganized archives that Carolyn Mattern has done, discovered the, the uh, case of the missing peers, uh, and uh, which I think helps explain the long-term problems here. Uh, Charlie Qualiana has been involved here uh, for many years, uh, working on the 1994 uh, recommendations, and also uh, he prepared the, uh, um, uh, the Historic Structures Report of 2004. I think he's best known in Madison for uh, being the lead on the uh, great uh, capital uh, renovation of some years ago. Next, please. Uh, now, we have approached uh, several other people. This is, of course, very preliminary. Very, very early on, uh, the RA National Wayne Vandenberg is somebody, uh, a contractor with whom the, the feasibility and uh, the, the design and, and placement of the, this lightweight uh, truss structure uh, has been discussed. And Steve Kramer is a professor at UW-Madison and he, working with Connor Nealon, would verify and review uh, Rene Dupuis' findings uh, in a peer review, uh, uh, in a peer review manner, to make sure that what uh, our, our engineer has recommended is in fact uh, solid and meets industry standards. Next, please. And uh, th these, the uh, you see the Findorf and Kramer name there. These are names that have come to. Other, to Charlie Qualiana's lips, to other people, uh, immediately. There's nothing there, are no contracts or anything of that sort. Uh, we, you can see we would need several different contractors uh, and other miscellaneous, any repair work uh, needed, uh, any attic ventilation and so on. Uh, and the thought of the roof committee is that we should most probably have a, an, an owner's representative too, as uh, Dave Weber represented uh, FUS interest in the construction of this building. Uh, and now I will introduce Tom Muskelly, the uh, FUS ma uh, facilities manager. Next slide, please. Thanks. I'm just going to give you an overview, a general overview of the timeline, a little bit of where we've been and where we're going, and um, some ideas about when we'd like to do this. Um, so we've been in the investigation of the process of the project. Uh, we've done the analysis of the roof structure and looked at options for stabilizing trusses. We still need to look at options for ventilating the roof. We have some, some ventilation uh, up in the attic space, but um, it has not been determined if that's adequate for what we're trying to do yet. Um, and uh, as many of you know, we're, um, we're going to do a pro renovation project and we are going to make sure that we understand the overlap of those two projects. Um, and it's been advised that we do the roof before we do the pro. Go ahead, Steve. Um, the work that's based on the investigation, uh, we're going to engage services contractors for the feasibility and on construction and cost. Uh, Sam kind of alluded to some of that. Um, if you're bringing that stuff in from the top or do you need to come in through the hearth room and auditorium space? Uh, develop a strategy for stress repairs, undertaking other related work and installing the new roof. Uh, all this process will be go through a series of refining. Um, we're gonna cultivate congregation awareness and support part of the reason why we're here today. Uh, architectural mock-ups of the new roof system. This is something that uh, Charlie Qualiana, the preservation architect, highly recommends. Uh, there will be some cost associated with that, but it would give us a real good feel of how things would look, and this would involve actually taking sections of the roof and installing what it is that we'd like to see. Um, uh, the architectural drawings and specs for preservation, stabilization, and rehab work. Uh, we'll develop our detailed schedule for each project and then refine estimates of the probable costs. And our goals right now, um, and the good news is that uh, people in the construction trades are telling us this is 
realistic. Uh, we're hoping to begin construction by removing the roof in the spring of 18, uh, do the stabilization work early summer. By midsummer, we'll be looking at roof replacement, do the prow restoration in the fall, and then the last part will be to do all the other little stuff that needs to happen, like soffit repair and painting and those kind of things that are related. And from here, I think we're taking, uh, we're going to bring Sam up one more time. Thanks, Tom. So one of the things I mentioned before is that the board asked us to provide a recommendation. And um, I'm going to talk about that, but I also want you to just to remind you all that the reason that you're here is so that you can um, give your opinions as well. So um, these are the these are the recommendations of the of the roof group. Um, just again, put up there. These are the things that we determined were worth uh, looking at as we made our recommendations. Um, and again, just waterproof. The ability to keep the building dry is, um, according to our consultants, um, is across the board is the same from all of them, but certainly durability and cost and, and all those things I talked about before are important. Next slide, please. So um, we've come up with one way of doing this. <laughs> uh, there are others, um, and we, can, we will talk to the board more about that. We wanted to come up with um, a more uh, objective way to doing uh, some things that are subjective. So what we did was a doom poll. <laughs> we put a poll together, and everybody that was on the roof group got to, to, to rank every option um, with every criteria from a level of one, meaning it didn't meet the criteria well, to three, meaning it, it, met, it met that criteria very well. And then simply put a score to each of them. And there are different ways you could do this. You could also weigh, um, put a different weight on each criteria. So if you feel like one criteria is more important than another, you can give it a higher a higher weight. We did not do that, but that is a conversation that we want to have with the board to see uh, if that would help. And as you can see, these are um, the average scores that we, or I shouldn't say the average scores, the total scores that we got um, for each of those options. So the highest scoring one was to replace the roof with the material um, that is most closely aligned with, with what Frank Lloyd Wright originally designed. It scored 174 points, and it went simply in that order, 159 for a painted, the painted steel option, 131 points for the um, asphalt option, but with the Bermuda detailing, and then 127 points um, for just the, the uh, plain um, asphalt roof option. I think I have one more slide. Um, so, end result was um, that we would replace it with copper that we um, do look at, and we haven't talked a lot about renewable energy, certainly the uh, Loja roof is one area that is an option, but we also have some flat roofs that we haven't talked about that are, are prime for, for um, solar as well. And so that, that's another thing that we want to continue as part of the conversation is where can we utilize solar panels on the roof? Um, we need to develop the strategy will, um, for the structural repairs and certainly do that in light of, uh, of what the ultimate decision on what material we use to, to make the roofing repairs. Um, and then take it, take it full advantage of the fundraising opportunities afforded by copper replacement. We think there are certainly avenues, as we've said a couple of times here uh, this afternoon already, that we need to reach outside of um, the congregation to look at possible donation opportunities um, for that. So um, one last thing Molly's going to talk about, where are we going from here? All right, we're almost coming to an end. Okay, next steps. So here are the next steps regard regarding the process. Um, between August 6th and September 17th, we'll be doing tabling in the comments. So we'll have a uh, roof advisory team members, uh, staff and volunteers there to share the information and answer and listen to what you have to say. Any comments are always appreciated. August 16th, the Board of Trustees will be meeting 
uh, and they will discuss and they will vote on a recommendation to the parish. And they'll take into consideration the findings that we have presented to them uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the roof team. Next slide. And then on August 18th, uh, the Board of Trustees will hopefully be submitting an article about their parish recommendation for the September newsletter. So that article will be their recommendation uh, to the parish and can be read in the September issue. And then finally, on September 17th, uh, the Board of Trustees will make a motion regarding the roof project and the parish will be able to vote. Those are the next steps. So, next slide please. Uh, questions and answers and also listening. This is uh, really key to our process is that we listen to what you have to say. We may not have all of the answers today, but we certainly want to listen. Next slide, please. So after we finish here, if you still have questions, comments, uh, please be sure to, to contact March. Uh, right over here, she's waving her hand, and uh, she'll be coordinating and uh, processing all of the information uh, that you may have that is not yet addressed today. So, going back to the listening and questions, uh, Monica has a mic, so she'll be coming around to, to uh, where you are, and we'll begin that process. Hi, I'm Mary Savage. And in this day of computer-assisted design, anybody, any interior decorator can immediately change your room arrangement on their computer screen. Uh, could we find somebody with those skills that would do a mock-up of the three different roof styles, or four different roof styles? That's a suggestion. So just to name again, we'll make sure to take note of all of these suggestions for the board and then we'll, um, we'll go through the process of discernment starting at that next board meeting. Um, I want to comment about preservation architects. So I saw that, that in 1994, the preservation architect said that since Frank Lloyd Wright said to poke nails through the waterproofing, that we need to do that again. And people said, yes, people did that. Poked holes through the waterproof. What? I mean, and I remember being in a meeting where the preservation architect said, and this is before we built this building, they said, oh, Frank Lloyd Wright loves the car. What Frank would want is for you to put the parking lot right next to that building. That's what he would want, so you should do that. That's when I said, those preservation architects can kiss my ass. You know what I mean? We're not doing that, so let's be careful. What are these preservation architects telling us what to do? And then two, so copper used to turn green back in the day. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful, right? What would Frank say today? The copper turns this ugly brown color. You think he'd still want to use copper? I mean, let's really think, okay? Thanks. Um, just a point of order. I think we're gonna just take a minute. Let's hear Elizabeth. At the end, at the end, Dave, if you want to say your piece, let's do that. But let's continue to make sure there's ample time for the people that came and listened. Thank you so much, Dave. Hi, I'm Deb Lawrence. Uh, Sam and I have avoided the roof topic because we don't necessarily agree at home. Uh, but I had a question about Bermuda roofs. Um, you don't see them a lot in the Midwest, and I'm assuming they're from Bermuda. Has anybody been willing to say, yeah, copper will last 100 years in a Bermuda roof format? I just want to say that if anybody wants to know what a steel roof looks like, I have one on my house. Oh, 
Uh, George Wysock, I, I just want to know how far the roof would be repaired. Would the uh, rubber roof be taken off also and repaired all that too, in addition to just the uh, Yes. Landmark. Yeah, all of the numbers you saw today included both of the landmark, both the landmark and the loggia. It even includes that steep portion that we discussed we might not need to do. Okay. So thank currently you. it's everything. Yes. My name is Neil Gruber. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the committee for the work that you've done. It Maybe unfortunately, I'm a retired professional engineer, so I, I, I'm going to keep my questions, or this question, uh, as simple as I can. <clears throat> when evaluations of differing designs are typically done, the end product needs to be a, a benefit cost analysis that allows you to look at all of these different alternatives not only with respect to the cost, which you've done a great job with, but also the benefits. They may or may not be different. These roof designs have advantages and disadvantages, each one of them. Some, one factor is cost. The second might be longevity. But with respect to the roof and the use of the building with different roofs, there are other benefits that I don't know if the committee has thought about for example, long-term maintenance and cost of operating the facility. Each of these roof designs, based on their term of life, impact that stream of capital, uh, excuse me, that stream of maintenance cost. We look at the buildings and there is a kind of qualitative benefit. We are giving <laughs> preservation architecture <clears throat> large space. Um, in order to allow us, in, as a congregation, to keep a landmark, a national landmark, a historic landmark requirement, uh, um, categorization. I look at those as benefits to some regard. I also look at them as costs. In order to do that, we incur a cost as a congregation. So I, I think my comment in general is, that some discussion should accompany the cost side, a benefits discussion should accompany the cost side. In that way, uh, from a qualitative sense, the congregation can also chime in in a, in a, a more balanced way. We'll leave the technical questions for later. Uh, I'm Barb Avery. Um, I'm the person that the capital campaign has to convince that that huge, what looks like a huge amount of money uh, should be spent on that building in this way. Because I've been a member of the congregation long enough that I, for one, don't believe for a second that that amount of money won't need to be spent again 25 years from now. Because I was here in 1994 when we spend a huge amount of money, amount of money last time. So I, I'm, your, I'm your audience that you have to convince. Having said that, you know, in the context of the, um, the options presented today, I'm not going to choose the asphalt. That doesn't make any sense just from a practical perspective, and I really appreciate the work that you all did. And, and, what, I, and what I would like you to encourage um, the people working so hard on this to do is to address my hesitations, and I'm sure the hesitations of many of the people in the congregation, which go something like this. Frank Lloyd Wright's vision gets um, alluded to and never explained. And one of the things that's in the back of my mind about Frank, Lloyd's Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's vision is, oh, wait a minute, haven't I heard like many times buildings are organic and he designed them to fall down? So if we are trying to be true to Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright's vision, then why on earth are we trying to keep it standing? Um, just pure logic, and maybe that's a complete myth. The other thing is, um, I think that it would be real, a really, really good thing to not start with the assumption that we are going to preserve the building in some form and replace the roof. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, I'm just saying that to address the concerns or the hesitations of people like me, 
expand your perspective, at least in your sales material, to include why would we do this in the first place as opposed to, I don't know, turn it into a memorial garden that looks like, you know, an ancient Roman ruin, ruin in Great Britain. You know, I mean, there are some very creative things that we could do with the building to honor Frank Lloyd Wright in a different way um, that would be a lot less expensive. And I know this is heresy. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of where people's minds go when you say, once again, let's spend a huge amount of money on something that I'm predicting we'll have to do again in the future. My name is Christy Minahan, and um, the, I find the option of the steel painted roof appealing. Um, I think that that would have the visual um, continuity that would be, um, I, I think that would be important. Um, I'm wondering two things about that. One is, is the is steel about the same weight as the copper? It is? Okay, and then would it need to be repainted frequently? <laughs> So that kind of gets at the maintenance question that, that was raised earlier. So that's just a question to think about and throw in the mix. Um, and then also I was wondering for the feedback from the congregation, whether there's any point where you're actually gonna ask people to kind of do a vote, not a binding vote, but just to get an idea of what, what people would prefer. Yeah, so after the board reviews, um, it is our recommendation that they then put their recommendation in front of you all. Um, so that's at the September parish meeting. So yes, if should the board decide they would vote on the roof. Am, oh, sorry, repeat. Got it. Yes, understood. I think they've heard that. Joe, did you want to say anything or do you feel comfortable? Um, yeah, maybe the way we could do that is electronically somehow, because that would be interesting just to sort of take a straw vote of where do we stand? I mean, where, what are people thinking at this moment? I'm not opposed at all. I mean, we need to bring more democracy to the process anyhow. This might be... Explore that option. <clears throat> I'm a... I'm listening, and I've been, I'm Herman Falstahausen, used to give tours of this building. I'm a big hobbyist uh, su supporter of the ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, I have a little, I now uh, work as a volunteer city planner, so I sit in a lot of discussions like this. I feel we're painting ourselves into a corner because we're putting up options which start by assuming that the congregation is going to pay this cost. And that is obviously frightening to all of us because you can't expect a historic monument of global significance to be borne, the cost to be borne only by one small community of persons. So I would like to suggest to the committee that there be a parallel uh, committee or group looking at how to raise capital for a historic monument. <clears throat> and that capital, the support for the Notre Dame or the Statue of Liberty should not come only from the people who live near it. It should come from the wider community of supporters of historic architecture. And this is really a very significant piece, a breakthrough pre piece of human creativity. And I'll prove that to you in a minute. I used to carry this around to show how this roof was created. It's really a, B1, a B2 bomber, <laughs> and it has an airplane wing structure which gives it strength. 
Now, Frank Lloyd Wright's idea is what's significant here because it's a historic idea. Frank Lloyd Wright was very opposed to copying the Gothic steeple and pasting it on every religious building. He said that's totally un-American. We need to have a way to make the church have a steeple without tacking it on the top. So now the church is the steeple. And the prow, if you give tours to visiting international architects, the prow is known worldwide. And it deserves to be preserved with the Bermuda, meaning horizontal placed copper seams. But you can't ask this congregation to bear that, all of that cost. So I'd like to suggest we see a capital committee formed and that the capital committee look at options for raising a couple of million dollars. This is the 150th anniversary of Frank Lloyd Wright's birth. There is a huge celebration planned in New York City in September. And the, conserv the Frank Lloyd Wright Conservancy is targeting every building like this one to help make sure these buildings are preserved. So we're preserving the Mona Lisa. We don't want to just walk away by discussing among ourselves whether it should be A or B or C, but we should be looking at how we can get the world to help support this cause. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Gail Bliss, Wow, uh, and um, I can talk about rank choice voting if we want to do some sort of straw poll, and I'll, I'll take that offline. That's a way of not saying, well, it's sort of a both and from today's sermon. Um, so you can say, this is my first choice, and this is my second choice, and this is my third choice, so that it's not just... Um, 24% said this, and 26% said that. And so 26% wins because the rest of them were smaller than that kind of numbers. But what I, what I started out to put up my hand to say was have we considered putting a non-Bermuda roof under the part that will become solar panels if we are planning on putting solar panels up there? Because I see no point in adding cutesy details that we will then hide that don't work in this climate if it's really a Bermuda roof. Uh, personally, I wish Frank Lloyd Wright hadn't designed the building and we didn't have to put up with this stuff, but if we can get other people to help pay for it, oh well, that works. <laughs> I'm gonna hand off to, uh, to someone else, but I did want to name that option four uh, is an asphalt option without the Bermuda. Um, and we'll make this PowerPoint available online for all of us that want to review later. I just had one uh, question that doesn't have to be answered this moment, but um, aside from losing visitors, what is, are the financial impacts of losing landmark status? Uh, this is Rob Savage. And um, I like the comment on looking externally for funding. And I thought back to our trip to England uh, a couple summers ago, where we were in the Salisbury Cathedral, which had a problem with roofs, if any of you have ever been there, and was had to be repaired twice, once by Christopher Wren, and the other was up there in um, the north of England, York, the York Cathedral. And basically, they were iconic buildings, and they went looking across the nation for people to kick in to support so you would end up with the structure still standing. So I think that the idea of looking externally for money is a great idea, because 
I know that it will be hard for us to come up with that much. I'm Charles Stinger. I serve as a tour guide. Um, my wife and I have lived in Madison for six years. We joined FUS only because, having never belonged to a church in Buffalo where we live, out of curiosity, we happened to visit here to see what the Wright Building looked like. So there is a point about the attraction of this as a significant site in drawing people here who then can discover, as my wife and I did, the richness of the community which is, belongs to this place. Other, two other quick points. Uh, two years ago in guiding, there was an architect couple from Toronto. As I said, people come from all over the world to see this. But they had seen virtually every right building, and they insisted that, to their minds, the two most significant right buildings that you had to see and experience were Falling Water and this building. So it ranks right up there. I mean, it is a landmark in American architecture and in Wright's career. That's important, I think, to bear in mind. And one last anecdote from a tour last week, which was that the person who came to the Oshkosh Arc, Arc, um, aircraft show, uh, who came, drove from Southern California, happened to be interested in seeing what the Wright Building looked like here, went on the tour, afterwards said, I'd like to just sit in the auditorium like we know Wright did, experience what it feels like after the tour is over, and then provided a $100 extra donation that came out of that experience. Just the sense that there is a broad community beyond those of us who are current members that connects this building to a wider world and just to reinforce those points that it is important in our thinking. I do want to mention uh, and speak to those who have talked about getting outside uh, financial funding uh, resources. We do have a team set up as part of the capital campaign to investigate and research uh, outside funding sources. So I do invite all of you who have said that uh, to join that particular team. We are going to have a volunteer uh, capital campaign uh, meeting on Tuesday, August 8th, to discuss the various uh, teams that have been identified to help uh, promote the and to succeed in our capital campaign. So please join us on August 8th, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the outside funding options. I'm Mark Schultz. Um, I've been a member here uh, or have participated for about 30 years. And um, in that period, as we've gone through cycles of leaking and repairs, um, I've heard about uh, failed solder joints and failed designs. Uh, each time new copper's been added, uh, uh, we've, we were told we have an expert roofing company uh, that does this kind of work and yet the, the failure of the, the copper system continues. Uh, so there, uh, copper expands readily when it heats and cools. And uh, so that's, that's the source of the problem and that produces stresses which cause uh, uh, solder joints to fail. So I, I would really like to hear how we will solve this problem or how anybody can solve the problem. Um, as to the color of the copper, I find the green uh, shade gorgeous. Um, in our neighborhood, uh, we saw a home go up with a copper roof, and for a while it was shiny copper. It started to dull a bit, but I knew, you know, it's going to stay brown. Uh, and then, on another occasion, we drove by, and it's a beautiful green. Uh, so there are chemical means to make that modification. I, I don't know about the durability uh, or suitability for our situation, but that is, that is an option. Uh, the copper doesn't have to go to brown. Um, also, um, uh, there are alternatives to asphalt. Uh, on our home, we use a, uh, 
A roofing material is derived from uh, a high recycled content of EPDM rubber, which is the type of material used for lining landfills. Uh, it's extremely durable. Our product uh, has a 50-year rating, and it's much lighter than asphalt. Uh, it's uh, hail just doesn't touch it. It's a injection molded uh, compound. And uh, so that potentially could be an alternative as well. Uh, Tom Garber here. I wanted to make uh, three points. Um, the first would be that the preservation architect in 1994 was not Charles Qualiana, it was someone else. Uh, the, so, just uh, uh, it was a man named Levine uh, from Iowa. Uh, the, the second point, uh, there's a little plaque uh, up in the lobby of the landmark auditorium. It's uh, sort of semi-hidden around the corner, but that plaque is from the American Institute of Architects and was given to the First Unitarian Society in 1960 or 61, a year or so after Frank Lloyd Wright's death. And of the several hundred Frank Lloyd Wright buildings extant at that time, this was one of 17 which uh, the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, identified as being uh, uh, of worldwide importance uh, to the, the vision and to culture uh, and to the uh, achievements of uh, mid-century uh, design. Uh, and I, I would point out to, to Mark that the, the copper will hold up if the substrate is, uh, uh, is stiffened. I, I was going to add a little bit on the preservation architect question, too. Um, in 1994, it was more the more than we just rolled over. We sold the veto power over everything on, that happens on the campus over 15 years. It was called a historic easement. And that's expired, and it's something we need to keep in mind as we're raising money um, in terms of what do we sell and do we really want to sell it. Is this on? Um, okay, I'm going to make the comment that I was afraid to make before. Um, I know I was one of the people who voted to go ahead with this when we had our meeting. What was that in May? Something, and after, um, so James Morgan talked today about what are some of the components of white supremacy culture. There are a lot of components. He talked about a few of them, and one is the sense of urgency, that we think we have to do this right now so we can start in the spring. And if we do that, then we won't have time to discuss what Barb Avery was talking about and things like that. And that I have this knot in my stomach, like we have to rush and do this right now. We can't be inclusive. You can't be inclusive when you have this sense of urgency. And that's another reason not to do that, is that if we really do want to hear from our people, then we can't vote September 17th on what we want to do. Um, and so that's what I want to say is that the, the sense of urgency is, is just not a good way to do this whole process, which is so important for the future of this congregation. And as you know, we are a beacon of Unitarian Universalist con congregations in this country. I'm Larry Fanland, and I know you've got to thank you for the committee, but I am really just always struck by the dedication and the talent that our membership comes up whenever we have a challenge. And I think the process they have designed to make this decision is excellent, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it comes out. Uh, Richard Miller, I was a member of this committee. I'm uh, the guilty party for the asphalt shingle option. 
Uh, I was, I used to be the president of the Friends of the Meeting House, so I suppose people thought I was going to be the safe preservation boat. But I have other values, and I think this congregation has complex values. Um, our seventh principle about uh, living in harmony with nature compels me to, uh, to really, my motivation is to push for uh, as much renewable energy as possible on this campus. We are in fact an energy hog thanks to our uh, unfortunately not yet green geothermal system. We use a lot of electricity, it's very expensive and it's mostly coal powered in this area. So renewable energy is a, is a passion for me and I think a core value of this congregation uh, through that principle. Um, I, uh, I'm intrigued by the hybrid model. I've heard it a couple of times. Um, uh, Gail mentioned it, so uh, I think that it, it might add some cost, but not a lot of cost, to put the basic copper roof uh, back up in a careful way if we had the resources. And, but not, but uh, just on the loggia and the B-wing roof, which is a beautiful southern exposure to put up uh, some just plain black solar panels. Um, so that's, that's an option I hope that can go forward and people can make uh, feedback like that to March if they choose to. Thank you. Uh, Mike Lino here. I've been a member here for about 10 years. I'm on the Board of Trustees right now. And I'm wondering, have we considered the possibility of uh, something that Richard just brought up, hybrid where we we do one aspect for one portion of the roof and then perhaps something else for another portion of the roof um, I know I'm I'm intrigued by the uh, the Tesla solar roof myself um, since it's come out it's it's fairly new we don't know all the details about it yet so I don't know uh, for instance the weight ratings of the the tile panels that they have I don't know if it's feasible with the given roof structure that we have, but if we just put it on the loggia area, maybe it would work better. Um, I'm just wondering if that's something that we can consider as a congregation uh, also. I know you've done a lot of work already, but maybe we can throw this into the mix too. Mike asked uh, what percentage of our electric consumption we could generate from panels. Um, we have a couple of estimates from uh, solar contractors. The flat roofs around the courtyard, if, uh, when they are, um, have solar installations, could generate about 10% of our 400,000 kilowatt hour annual consumption. Um, uh, about a similar amount, another 10% could be generated from uh, solar panels on the loggia and B-wing roofs. Hi, I'm Chuck Evenson. I just, this is a kind of a technical question that maybe was covered. Uh, if you put a copper roof on, apparently it does not, with the materials we use today, turn green. Yep. It does not do that. Uh, is that. There's a hotel in Quebec City called the Chateau Frontenac that has this really nice, I'm sure it's a copper roof, why doesn't it turn green anymore? Is it just a change in the way the material is made? So the, yeah, it's, it's acid rain. Um, and to answer something that Mark mentioned before, you can um, chemically induce the green patina and you use an acid to do that. Um, it's actually a relatively mild acid, but it can be done, but it does take away I mean, it, essentially what's happening is you're eroding the material, and so it does take some of the longevity away from it if you do put a false patina on it. But, I mean, it is good news that we've uh, eliminated all the um, chemicals that we've been releasing in the, air, in the air to create the green patina, but now we don't get the green patina anymore. Uh, this is Rob again, and I want to uh, play off Mike's suggestion of the Tesla solar shingles. I wonder if uh, Elon Musk would like to use us as a, um, a case in point where he could have a wonderful building that's iconic, 
that he might be even willing to give us the shingles and help us out. I don't know. That's not my idea. That was actually her idea and actually uh, was brought up yesterday by uh, our, our youth advisory member to the board, Henry, who was really excited about the whole idea that maybe we should do this. So just a thought. Every, all of them were independent, so. I wanted to uh, follow up your comment about the renewable energy potential and the current existing issues here on the campus. You said that the geothermal system isn't functional. If the geothermal system was functional, would you see a typical 30 to 40 percent decrease in our uh, electric usage? Thank you, Roz. Geothermal system is functional as a heating and cooling system. Uh, we thought it would be more uh, a greener system because it doesn't require internal combustion and, and com combusting fossil fuels on this campus. So all it just totally run by electricity. So it's as green as the source of electricity that's running the pumps 24-7. Um, and we thought 10 years ago that that electricity would get greener faster than it has. It's still mostly a coal-fired power plant uh, for mg and &E. So it could be the geothermal system will be, will be greener and, and uh, more environmentally efficient it's potentially. Installation. Right. The installation and its operation and the source of power, they're separate in terms of Abs the absolutely. I'm Sandy Esbridge, and I don't, I don't have a strong feeling in any regard about what we do with our, our property here, with our campus. But I would make an observation that um, I think we've, as a congregation, we have decided that it's an, it's an, it's an okay time to go about a capital campaign, that we're ready for that. A capital campaign is a good idea. And I think when we, as a congregation, um, said good idea to that a few weeks ago, I'm not sure that we knew what a pull there would be between maintaining our physical campus and the, and the detail of these conversations that we're having today and the value that we all place in this as a spiritual community and, and, its, and its worship program and its social justice program and its music program and its religious ed program and the things that we love about this as a spiritual community. It, it always causes a little knot for me when it gets tangled up with our physical campus. Um, and, and I just wonder if that's one of the tensions that we, we feel and it, we haven't said it out loud yet. With regard to MG&E and their coal-fired work, I was talking to somebody from the local chapter of the Sierra Club and there's a major effort to push MG&E to get rid of coal. So if anybody wants to use that as something they would like to be doing, um, I just thought I'd say it's already a thing. So check with the Sierra Club and join that issue. Anyone else? I'm gonna do Dorit first, since she hasn't said anything, if that's okay. My question has to do with, does the range of estimates at the high end, or wherever, include if we need to install more at ventilation in the attic, and does it include maybe having to um, reinforce the structure if we use the heavier asphalt? includes <clears throat> some amount for ventilation, but because we don't know exactly what we may have to do with ventilation, we don't know if that's enough. It does not include anything for any additional support if we don't use metal, if we use something else. 
um, and we don't know what that amount might be because we haven't. Mary Savage again. Um, I, I'm speaking specifically to Elizabeth and other people's comments about the need to, for rushing this whole thing. And um, at the beginning, you guys showed that there was a sag in the roof and you showed that the plaster was starting to come down. Um, is that purely cosmetic? Do we need to rush? That's my question. Do you want to answer that? We've asked that question to SRI, um, and essentially they've said, move sooner rather than later. Um, we've asked questions about, what about winter? What about when there's a heavier load of snow? Um, and no one's going to tell you it's falling next year, but they're certainly saying, you want to move on this. Um, I think we should continue to question all assumptions and get multiple opinions, which is something that we're discussing. Um, so getting a peer review of the, of the uh, report that we received is the next step for us. Um, but yes, there are concerns about how long we can wait for, for, for security and for safety of all. This is Neil Gruber again. Earlier in the presentation, the details about the structural reinforcement of trusses J and K um, and the use of uh, light, lightweight metal I would like a little bit more information. Does that mean the trusses would be basically sistered? You build a second truss out of metal adjacent to the wooden truss. Yeah. Design could be similar, design could be a little bit different depending on the load and, and that's how you would do that? That's what, that's what this structural repair basis is founded on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my question is we've got a rubber membrane on part of the roof that we are now finding will last 20 years. Um, so that's a considerable length of time. And our estimates on the uh, copper were to, for doing the whole roof. Um, has there any thought been given to repairing and replacing the copper on the auditorium and leaving the rubber membrane in place for the foreseeable future? The committee um, did talk briefly about that. Um, our recommendation to the board was based on the idea that a successful capital campaign, both internally and externally, will get us enough money to do the whole thing. If that turns out not to be the case, then that was one thing we thought about, is here's something, maybe we do the, the, the big structural repair that we have to do now and fix the auditorium, and if we just don't have enough money, we can go for a few more years with the Lozier roof. But I don't think our committee thought that was a, that, that halfway measure was a good way to start out. Hi, I'm Sandy Weishock, and I just have a couple of comments. First, I would agree that we should definitely look to the external funding sources. I think there are a lot of people who are passionate about Frank Lloyd Wright and his architecture who would be more inclined to assist us. But I'm also very concerned that if the congregation would move forward and say, well, let's just go with the less expensive solution and, and put the asphalt roof on it, that the extra weight may create so many additional costs that we're not looking at. If they're not estimated in this, you might turn out to spend almost as much putting that asphalt roof on it in the end. Um, and that you might be dollar-wise and penny foolish or whatever. <laughs> Matthew Olson here. I saw on the presentation that there's going to be an inclusion of some more solar options, and I heard a fair amount of interest in learning more about these solar options and other ones. 
And so the question is, when will this group next get to see those solar idea, solar ideas included in some of the proposals uh, along that timeline? When is when are the additional solar options going to be presented to the congregation? That's a good question, Matthew, because frankly, the uh, concept of solar really hasn't come up in front of the board. Uh, when we actually started the roof task force, the whole concept was what are we going to do with the roof over there? And then the solar thing was sort of implanted. So I think what we need to do, and we were going to discuss this, for board members who are here, we're going to discuss this in a, in a week and a half. Do we need to start a task force around solar? Because if we're really going to consider it, we can't be just, we, we need to do it in an organized fashion. In, in the same way that we looked at the roof, it has to be separated, although it's sitting on the roof and it's going to impact it. Um, but we can't do it how we've been doing it. It needs to, yeah, I, th I think first we need to see what are the options, and then both those teams come together and see what are the hybrid opportunities. And we do have to think about, does that impact our status as a landmark? I mean, where, I mean, my question to everyone is, where is the status of landmark? Is it just on the landmark itself? Does it involve the loja? Does it involve the entire campus? I mean, what is our national historical relevance here that we have to... Up to uh, the neighborhood. All the way through there, so we have to think about that. But then after that, we can do what we will. I just want to say again that uh, one of the teams that has been identified to work, uh, to succeed, to uh, accomplish this capital campaign is a solar project team. So again, I invite you to join us on Tuesday, August 8th, uh, because one of the project teams will be solar. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, we are meeting at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, August 8th, in room, oh, I have too many meetings coming up. I, I, is it E? Okay. A room E, courtroom, yard, courtyard, courtroom, <laughs> uh, courtyard E, on Tuesday, the 8th at 5. everyone for coming. Uh, yeah, thank you for your input and we need to continue the conversation clearly. Um, but please do um, email March if you have specific questions that we should be thinking about and we look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you everyone. <laughs>